So yeah, so awesome. thanks for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on PowerShell 7, but I want to cover some of the history. First, uh, if you don't know who I am, just a bit about me. So as introduced, I'm the engineer manager for our PowerShell team. I've got 11 engineers on the team, so not a huge team. Uh, but I do work with four different program managers. Some of them you may be familiar with on Twitter, like Joey, Sydney, uh, Danny, who also does like open SSH work with me, uh, and our new PM, Jason Helmick, who's pretty well known within the PowerShell community. Uh, I've actually been at Microsoft for almost 20 years. Like actually my actual anniversary for 20 years will be in January. So yeah, I've been at uh, Microsoft for a long time. Uh, I've only been on the PowerShell team about, I'd have to go, I have to figure out backwards, but maybe about like four or five years. Uh, before then, I spent a lot of time on WMI. Uh, my first project at Microsoft was actually Internet Explorer for Unix, but shortly after that, I was on the WMI team doing a out of band deliverable for NT4, so that kind of really dates me. Uh, but I was there when we first started the WinRAM project. I was there when we uh, you know, wrote that spec for the SOAP and all that stuff. But uh, I put all that behind, so I'm really focused on PowerShell these days. And in terms of what I actually own, what well, my team owns, um, you know, we own everything on GitHub for PowerShell, the PowerShell gallery, um, editor services, working on VS Code, Web Analyzer. I do own the OpenSSH project, which isn't directly related to PowerShell, but we do have PowerShell remoting over SSH these days. Um, PS3 line and PowerShell Get. The one thing that is um, no longer on this list for me is actually Windows PowerShell. That's been handed off to another team within Windows to uh, own servicing. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, and finally, as mentioned, you know, I do. Um, I don't tweet a lot. I'm not really big on the social team, but I do respond to questions and uh, I do provide updates where I think it's interesting about what's happening within the, the PowerShell team. So let's first go a little bit back in history. So uh, Windows PowerShell 5.1, which is probably where you started. So this is the latest version. Um, there are no plans to update the version that's in Windows. That means that there is no expectation that there'll be a Windows PowerShell 5.2 or a Windows PowerShell 6 or 7 or anything like that. Uh, Windows PowerShell 5.1 is the latest. Um, if you're on Windows 10, uh, there are small changes that may happen in Windows PowerShell 5.1 for compliance reasons or <laughs> reasons. And also, I want to make clear, like, there's no current plan uh, to remove Windows PowerShell 5.1. It's kind of like the Windows terminal team cannot remove cmd.exe. It's like there's just too many people dependent on it. <laughs> it's part of the Windows operating system. So you can expect that it will be there for indefinitely. Like, there's no plan to remove it. Uh, but it is fully supported, but supported here means that if you have a critical issue, you can go through uh, support. Um, and also, also there's critical bug fixes that go in, um, but there's definitely no new feature work. So all the things that we're doing in PowerShell core, PowerShell 7, have no plans of going back to Windows PowerShell 5.1. Uh, the way you should think about it is Windows PowerShell 5.1 is complete. It's done. Um, and one of the features, I guess you can think about it, is it's very stable because there's no changes happening within the Windows PowerShell 5.1. My recommendation is if you have existing business workloads on Windows PowerShell 5.1, you know, there's no reason to move it off of 5.1. Um, if you're producing new automation and you want to leverage some of the new stuff, then you can use it side by side. And we'll go over some of those details later. Okay. So let's talk about uh, what's happened since Windows PowerShell 5.1. So I pretty much joined the PowerShell team when the uh, idea of taking PowerShell open source and also cross platform came about. This was originally announced. Uh, now it's been over three years now. So we announced it back in August uh, 2016 that this was even happening. The big change really is moving from .NET Framework, which is shipped in Windows, to .NET Core, which at the time was a very new thing. Um, at the time we were doing PowerShell Core 6, I believe .NET Core was on version 1.1 or 1.2, and they've come a long way since. Uh, and then, the, you know, one of the big things is really providing PowerShell as uh, an automation platform and also a shell for beyond just Windows, right? Windows PowerShell obviously started with Windows. And one of the things we wanted to say or do is how can we attract new customers to PowerShell? Um, and the way to do that is look beyond Windows. And one of the key things that we decided early on is if you want Linux adoption, you have to be open source. And if we're open source, um, we could also get contributions from the community, which has um, actually provided a lot of great features and bug fixes in PowerShell Core. Uh, and then following this timeline, uh, you know, we GA'd the first version of the open source PowerShell, PowerShell Core 6.0, January 2018, so almost two years ago now. So before I move on, I just want to see a quick show of hands. Like, how many of you have actually used PowerShell Core 6? Oh, 
so that, most of you, that's good. And how many of you are playing with PowerShell 7 at this time? Any? Okay, thanks. So I can go through history, PowerShell Core 6 roadmap. Um, 6.0 was open source. Um, you know, the first, the, the really the big feature set of PowerShell Core 6.0 was making it open source. It was a ton of work because uh, we had a lot of, for example, tests in the Windows um, data, uh, on the first repo, we had maybe something like 100,000 tests. The problem is all of those were, well, the best way to put it is they only worked against a proprietary test framework that was not never planned to be made open source. Um, and also when we did a bunch of analysis early on, there's a lot of redundancy in the test cases. So for example, if you do like code coverage, we found that certain parts of the code was actually hit like five uh, by five different tests. So there's a lot of redundancy. So one of the early decisions was actually to write a bunch of new tests in Pester and make those open source as well. Um, so six months later, so back in the Pasha core six timeframe, we, we kind of shipped new major ver or new minor versions every six months. So for six one, the focus was really, you know, now that we have a base platform that was cross platform, it was open source. We really want to focus on Windows PowerShell compatibility so that people who are using it could use it on Windows and have a great experience. And a lot of the effort was actually not so much in PowerShell Core 6 one itself, but taking resources from my team and actually working with partner teams in Windows to really validate that uh, their inbox modules work with PowerShell Core 6 and making changes on their behalf and submitting pull requests to those teams to get it accepted. So I believe uh, there's a blog post by Joey on this. I think we hit something like 60, maybe up to 70% compatibility with uh, a lot of the modules that ship with Windows. Uh, on the 6.2 timeframe, and this would be six, six months after 6.1, uh, we focused a lot of the team's effort on release automation. So this is where we moved off of App Vader. We moved entirely to Azure DevOps. Um, one of the reasons is that we didn't want to maintain two different CI systems. It made sense to kind of use Azure. I mean, we're also Microsoft, so it makes sense to do that. Uh, but Azure DevOps at that point had matured enough that we could actually rely on them for our uh, releases and also for our CI. We had to spend a lot of effort to automate a lot of our testing because we released a, a ton of Linux distros, different versions of uh, Windows, things like that. Um, so we spent a lot of effort and it basically reduced a release because we released previews every month. Took about five calendar days approximately with like three engineers working on a release down to about, depending on if there's issues, about you know two calendar days with like one and a half engineers. It was significant effort. Uh, my plan is to eventually maybe at PowerShell Summit have some of the engineers who worked on this to kind of talk about their experience because we use PowerShell a lot um, to do the automation so they can hopefully show you guys how you guys can do that yourselves for your own projects. All right, so now we're moving to the future here. We're talking about PowerShell 7. So the first thing you notice is that we drop core from the name. So similar to uh, what .NET Core is doing, um, they're dropping .NET, uh, dropping the core name from .NET Core with the next release of .NET 5. So the big thing here is really, if you've been using PowerShell Core 6, you should not think of this as a new version that has like a bunch of breaking changes. This is really conceptually PowerShell Core 6.3. Um, but we really wanted to drop the core name because I think the cause a lot of well, some of the feedback we got from customers is that when they see the name core, it means smaller. And when they say smaller, it means like uh, a sub part of the uh, capability of PowerShell. So we really want people to think of this as the PowerShell. So now it's just known as just PowerShell, PowerShell 7. One of the big efforts that we're focusing on PowerShell 7 is to say legitimately that, you know, we, we believe this is a viable replacement for Windows PowerShell for your daily needs. Um, and I'll show some demos and I'll talk about some of the things that we did to make that happen. Um, we are relying, and one of the reasons we're able to make this claim is that .NET Core 3.1 is what we're actually gonna be shipping with. Has actually brought back a lot of the uh, .NET APIs. So it's actually much more compatible with .NET framework modules. Um, otherwise, it would have been a much harder effort on our part. And we also spent a lot of effort bringing back a bunch of the old uh, Windows PowerShell commandlets, and I'm gonna have demos on all that. Um, and also some work still within Windows. So we, we kind of looked at the remaining set of modules that we weren't able to validate in the PowerShell Core 6.1 timeframe uh, and do some additional validation and working with those teams and get those modules in Windows 10 marked as core compatible. So again, you're not gonna get that if you're on a down level of Windows. When I say down level, I mean like Windows 7, Windows 8, 8.1, stuff like that. Uh, but you need to be on Windows 10 or Server 2019 to get uh, the 
native Windows inbox modules to work with PowerShell 4 or 7. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, PowerShell 7 roadmap real quick. Uh, hopefully everyone saw, you know, the preview six, which is our last preview for PowerShell 7 was released last month. The plan is to have a release candidate uh, released probably next week, uh, maybe like mid next week or so. We're, we're working on that right now. Uh, well, just before we haven't started the release yet, we're, we're getting some uh, last minute changes in before we actually kick off the release. But we'll probably start the release process on Monday. Uh, and if you, if anyone in the room has been contributing to the repo, it means that uh, anything that's merged in master is not automatically in PowerShell 7 at this point. We actually cherry pick specific changes that get uh, approved. And then our current target is to have general availability uh, next month, which will be January. So one of the big changes with PowerShell 7 is actually the support lifecycle. So with the PowerShell Core 6, we were aligned with what Microsoft calls the modern lifecycle. That means that after a release, then the previous release, so after we release 6.2, and 6.1 was on a six month uh, life cycle. So that means after six months, we will not support anymore, which means that you're not gonna get any updates at all. So with PowerShell 7, this will be um, our first LTS long-term servicing. So this is because it's also based on .NET Core 3.1, which itself is long-term servicing. Long-term here means three years. That means that if you deploy PowerShell 7 in your environment, you will be guaranteed um, three years of support of .NET Core. So technically it will be, uh, because .NET Core 3.1 shipped uh, this month, it will be three years minus one month because it will be one month behind. Uh, basically, we'll provide security fixes. If there's critical issues that prevent you from uh, using partial center protection, you know, we'll look at that. We'll provide those fixes. Um, so you can depend on that for the next three years. And that also means because partial core six was on the old uh, modern life cycle, then 6.2 will end support after partial seven GA. And if we GA in January, barring any critical problems, that means that we will no longer support 6.2 in July. July will be the last time that you might get an update. So let's talk a bit before I hop into some demo stuff, uh, what's gonna look like after seven. Our current plan, and of course everything's subject to change. Um, we're gonna align with .NET's yearly release cycle. That means that uh, the next release will be probably be called Sapasha 7.1 and it'll be based on .NET 5. And the one after that will be uh, 7.2 and up based on .NET 6. So currently, .NET's team's plan is to have every other year be an LTS release. Um, so we're going to align with that because for us to have a, a long-term servicing support, we need .NET to also support it long-term servicing. So that means that uh, if you're on 7.0, then you can stay on that for the next three years. But I expect that most customers should probably move to 7.2, which should be two years after that. Three years again, starting from that point. And so on, unless .NET team uh, changes their plans, we'll probably stay on this plan. There's currently no plan barring any major breaking change or something like that to, to have like a PowerShell 8 at this point. We're not going to align with um, .NET's versioning, uh, jump into major versions all the time. So one thing I'll mention here um, is that there's also currently no plan to ship PowerShell 7 inbox and Windows. And the reason for that is not because we don't want to or you know, it is, there's no technical problem. It's really about support. Um, .NET Core long-term servicing, the longest support they provide is three years. Windows long-term servicing is actually five plus five. So we've got five years and then they have five years extended. Um, so three years is much less than 10 years. So currently we can't close that gap. We're still working with the .NET team, seeing how we can uh, resolve that. Cause I know for a lot of customers, it's very difficult to be able to install something in their Windows environment, even if it's signed and produced by Microsoft. Now, in terms of actual Windows PowerShell uh, compatibility within PowerShell 7, uh, as I mentioned, you know, there's some some of the modules that ship inbox. We've done uh, validation. We work with those teams to make sure they actually work with PowerShell 7. So those would just work. Uh, but then we have this new feature that came in in preview six, which is if you try to import a module and is not uh, just be clear, you import a module that is in Windows, so it's under System 32, and it is not marked as core compatible. So in the module manifest, there is this compatible PS editions that indicates how it's compatible. And I'll show them on this later, make it more clear. The idea is that we can actually leverage an existing PowerShell technology called implicit remoting. That way we can actually call out to Windows PowerShell to actually uh, invoke that commandlet within PowerShell 7. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with the Windows compatibility module that we shipped, uh, to be honest, I don't know exactly when we shipped that. Might have been, I think it was in the six one timeframe. 
Um, that uses WinRM remoting. So the big change here is actually, this is not a separate module. It's changes that we make in the PowerShell engine and it's using uh, the PowerShell jobs infrastructure. So it's actually talking to another process. It doesn't require WinRM to even be enabled. So uh, before I jump into a bunch of demos, uh, I just wanna see if there's any questions so far in any of the content I've already provided. Our point real quick. We'll go into Windows. I um, I use a MacBook as my regular daily to uh, self-host the non-Windows built. <coughs> All right. Uh, oh, so much about VS Code on the left. That's just to help me remember what I plan to demo. All right, so in uh, PowerShell 7 Preview 6 here. So the first thing that a lot of people will notice the very first time they use uh, PowerShell 7 is uh, errors look different, right? So actually before I show Windows PowerShell real quick, you know. So, you know, if you, if you have an error, then, you know, get Item in this, uh, this is not a good one. I should hold on. I think this whole yeah okay. So you get these errors, and you know one of the com complaints or the feedback we get from customers is there's just too much red on the screen. It's like there's a lot of information here that they just doesn't help them. Um, so one of the big changes we did is we really just made it a lot more terse, so it's more concise. Uh, this is a new view that you can um, change if you want the classic one. So. So right now, um, by default, it's going to be in concise view. But if you really want to go back to the old style, you can go to normal view. Like if I do the other one, call it item two. And you can kind of see, like you know, you have an error message. That, you know, tells you exactly what the problem is. And again, if we have bad error messages, you just tell us we can fix those things. But you don't have to worry so much about all the other uh, information that you would normally see, like here, that most users would not actually find useful. Actually, they actually find it confusing. Now, if you're a developer and you actually want to get more rich information, then we have new command that get error. It actually gives you a lot more information. So um, this is actually more than what you would normally get under normal view. You get stuff like the stack trace, uh, you know, the C sharp stack trace. You can also get the partial script stack trace. So this will make it easier to debug what the problem is. And let's see if I do if I have a multi error. So the script has a bunch of errors in it. And you can kind of see also when it's a script, we have a, you know, we have coloring, which I believe helps because um, not everything's just red now, but it also tells you, you know, this is on line three, there is this thing, there's the error, what the problem is. And again, if I were to run git error, or I can do the alias G-E-R-R, -R, then it tells me what um, is the last error. But of course, if you just look at, you know, this, this will also work if you want to look at that particular error. This will be probably one of the first things that people notice right away that is different in partial seven. Again, you can always go back to the old behavior if you prefer that. One, copy this URL because I'm not gonna remember it. All right, let's start over here. So, you know, in PowerShell core six, we made a lot of investments uh, besides making open source and cross platform to make it a great experience to use in cloud workloads. And the way we're thinking about it is really calling like REST APIs and importing or um, working with JSON. So here, um, I can show it from the Windows PowerShell. Let's clear this. So Postgres method, and I'm going to paste this year. So in this case, uh, this should fail because I'm uh, authenticated so uh, you're going to get this error message, right? Uh, and there are going to be a lot of scenarios where you want to be able to handle this error and do something with it. There may be information within this uh, HP error response that tells you what you need to do. So in Windows PowerShell, you would probably have to do something like stop and then you have to wrap it in a try. Or actually, you can also do a variable e. I, think I, have to, I have to do like the 
this. Actually, no, this is a terminating error. Uh, or this still gets up. But anyway, you can kind of see it's, it becomes difficult to manage the situation. So one of the changes in fact that came from the community is that, if I spell right, we have a skip HTTP error check. So to, to explain what's happening, the web commands both invoke web um, request and also invoke REST method have uh, code internally where if the response is a failure, meaning the HTTP status code indicates a failure, then it will turn that into a partial error record. Mm -hmm. So this will suppress that behavior. So again, if I touch this my buffer, then now um, you don't see the red because it's not an error, right? So it's an HTTP error, but it's not a PowerShell error. So I can also do stuff like um, errors. What is it? Like I can get a status code in S and do response headers variable H. So now if I inspect S, I can see that this was a 415. Um, I don't recall exactly what that means, but it's, a, it's an error in HTTP. And uh, I can also look at all the headers that was returned. So basically I can now have more advanced scripts where I can handle error conditions when I'm calling um, REST methods. Let's talk about some of the language features. So one of the things we did with the partial seven planning is we looked at all the top issues that were voted on by the community in the, the GitHub repo. So uh, we looked at stuff where people gave a bunch of thumbs up to issues that were open and these language features were really the some of the top voted ones. So the first one is a no conditional member property uh, method access. Um, this one is actually gonna stay in partial seven. But basically the idea here is, um, you know, right now Darson A doesn't contain anything. So let me go back to Windows Power Show, show how this will look. Um, I actually need to get, okay, so let's say, let me get up something for this, okay. So this is a method access. So if I do this, it's not gonna work because A is null, so you can't call two string on it. So with the new syntax, and I know some people would not like the requirement to have braces, but it is required. Then this won't fail because now following, if you're familiar with C-sharp syntax, this will say only call this method if this part is not null. So if I set A to equal something, and now if I call this again, then this will actually work because now this is not null. So basically the idea here is you can not, you don't need to have a bunch of checks against null. I mean, you still have to be careful here because you could have other logic in your script that does bad things. Um, so it should be used. Easily. <laughs> the idea here is that you don't need to now explicitly check if A is null or not null before you call its method. Um, similarly, you can also do it for arrays. So if I do something, I have to do a new variable like this, right? Then it won't work because B right now is null. Um, if I do, and the, um, the braces is required because in PowerShell, you can have a variable that has a question mark on the end. So I could actually do something like, um, it, you can argue whether or not you should do that, but there are other languages like Rust that I feel like <coughs> a question mark at the end. So rather than doing something like is admin equals true or something like that, then in Rust, you would do something like admin, right? Um, whoops. Well, if you type it right, but it's now null because that doesn't exist. But the idea here is um, we didn't want to break customers who are already using uh, variable names that have question mark in it. So it requires some braces. And just so you know, this is not new. This is an existing partial sentence that you may have already been using or not. Uh, but if I now make B like this, then back to here, and that works, right? So again, Previously, um, nothing happened uh, because B was null, but now that I can find it, it can get the, uh, well, this is index zero, so we get the second element. Uh, so let's talk about no coalescing and assignment now. So similarly, um, you know, a lot of this is really about making potentially more readable. I think if you get used to the syntax, it actually makes it more readable, but if you're new to it, it can actually be a little bit, a little bit confusing. So here, um, again, 
Uh, so B is already used, so I'll use C now. Let's see it more. So here, uh, I want to do some something if C is not null. This, uh, or in C is null here. C is null. So in this case, if it is null, it's going to do that. Um, so if I set it, then it's going to return that value. So the idea here is if C is null, then it's going to return wherever this uh, other part is. But if C is not null, it's going to return that value. So that means I could do, let me see what the real world case would be something like. Admin equals you know, user. Like I say, no user. This is just made up here, of course. But user right now is null. So then is admin is going to contain no user, right? But if I then set user equals to something else, and I run that same code, then now um, because user is not null, then is admin should be me. This is um, going to ideally save you some uh, checks against null. Uh, so similarly, um, assignment works very similar. So let me pick another thing here. So here, uh, because D was null at the time, it is gonna equal hello. Uh, I'm gonna change this to by. So now, because it's not null, then it shouldn't be assigned. So now uh, D should still be hello. So the idea here is only assign it if it's null. Otherwise, don't change the value. A ternary was a popular request. Um, so let me see. So in this case, it's going to be a little bit different. I can do something like, um, so we know that's true. If it's equal to hello, say uh, yes. Otherwise, you can say no. Uh, and we know, of course, it is. So the idea here is um, if this condition that you're checking is going to be true, then it will be, you'll return whatever this first thing is. Otherwise, it'll return the second thing. And you can also do something E equals. And of course, uh, it should be the first one because D right now is still set to hello. Again, this is uh, very popular in other languages, and you don't have to use it. It's just an option. Extended Unix file system info means I have to actually hop back. All right, the screen there. So this is um, if you're a if you're a Linux user. Go bigger. All right, and then if I can. I don't know if I have one second. I think this will start partial seven. Yeah. I actually want to start with six. All right. So this is partial core 6.3. So if I do a dir here, um, what you'll see is this is exactly what you would get on Windows, right? So you got this mode information, some date time information, and some length and file name. But a lot of Linux users are accustomed to doing the long format of LS. So this is a uh, native executable on, in this case, a Mac, Mac OS. It gives you a lot more information about, uh, you know, the user group and, and the, who owns the file and all that. So one of the changes that uh, Jim made is equivalent in PowerShell. So again, this is get child item. And now he's calling some native APIs on Unix system. So this only shows up on Unix, uh, but it shows you like the user information, the group information, um, basically equivalent of what you do with ls-s. Uh, okay, so let's tab completion. So um, one of the things that bothered me for a while was I'll go into Windows Posture to, to demo this. So if you want to change your interaction preference, right? Um, and you want to know, hey, what are the, all the options available? Then you have to do something like this. Uh, and then you have to look at the error message and tell you, hey, these are the these are the allowed values. You can't just put in this garbage. Um, so one of the things we changed is actually you can tab complete on that now. 
So this works for any variable whose type is an enum. Um, it also works if you um, add constraints to a variable. So I do something like update set. I. Then if I do I equals, oh, this is what happens when I do a live demo. I'm missing something here. Make sure that, okay. Ah, that's where I get, get my, forgot my syntax. All right. Rather than trying to get that working right now, I'm going to actually show a different one. Where if you zoom, all right, I can do animals. That's about right. I shouldn't do things live. <laughs> yeah. I know. Uh, all right. I have to think of top of my head. All right. Anyways, uh, believe me, it works. I can't, I can't remember exactly what the, the enum syntax and partial is right now. Uh, if we skip ahead. Oh, actually, I want to show error action preference break. Let's go to that again. All right. Um, so again, error action preference. So this is a new one um, that was added by Kirk Monroe, actually. So now here is we have a script. And actually, I do have a script because I have that multi one. So this one, all this does is actually have a bunch of errors in it. Um, then if I were to run it, then it's actually going to break into the, the command line debugger immediately. So you don't have to add like a wait debugger, um, things like that. So, all right. Um, so this actually makes it a lot easier to debug your scripts. I'm gonna put it back to. Continue. Actually, I guess I want to continue. I want it silent. Yeah. Let's that again. So select string. So this also came from the community. So just show you again what it looks like in Windows PowerShell. So I have some text here. Uh, let's see. Let's select the word uh, is here. Uh, and basically, if you if you're actually usually you would use it against like a text file, they have a lot more content. But here, um, you know, you, this is actually an object if you're not aware. But it tells you, you know, this is what's selected. Here's a pattern. But uh, basically, this output isn't as useful. So the big change here. I'm just I'm gonna type it again. To add emphasis, so I actually hit the first is. I forgot about this one. Um, if I add a spacer, I should hit the second one. But the idea here is now we can, because um, Windows now has DT100 support, we can actually use that to show exactly where it is. And this is still an object. So nothing has changed. So again, you can get the actual content, um, you know, to do in your automation. And if you don't want to see that, then there is also a uh, no emphasis to get back to previous behavior. But you know, one of the things you already saw, like especially like get error, um, we're adding a lot more color and kind of highlighting. And I think it really helps to uh, help see information. So in this case, all the green are all the member names and all the uh, stuff in the color would be uh, the content. And all this is um, user settable, so you can set these colors. Source. Hey, Steve. Yeah. Uh, are these uh, features turned on out of the box or are they experimental or what? Uh, great question. So, so the, our policy has been that in preview releases, all experimentals are on by default unless you have a settings file that disables something. Um, so that means that in preview six, if you never mess with the PowerShell config JSON file, then you would get all the features enabled by default because we want people to try them and give us that feedback. Uh, with the release candidate that's coming up uh, probably next week, 
It is not a preview, but it's not final either. But in that release, we are uh, turning off experimental features by default. Um, so a bunch of these features, so for example, the um, concise view and error, get error is going to be stable, so that won't be experimental. So that'll just be there by default. This was not experimental feature anyways, the second one, the uh, skip needs to be checked. For the language features, uh, ternary operator will be stable. No coalescing and assignment will be stable. The no conditional member property and method access, uh, which require the braces, is going to stay experimental. That means that uh, you can't use it by default, but you can always enable that experimental feature if you want to use it. Just one clarifying thing here. Experimental doesn't mean it's buggy. Experiment, experimental only means that the design is not considered complete. That means that if we make changes to the design, it's not considered a breaking change. Um, so that means that you should not depend on experimental features in production because we could change the design. Um, but it does mean that you can use it because it is uh, you know, fully tested and all that stuff. So it is uh, intended to be stable from a bug perspective, but not stable from a design perspective. Let me see what else. So the extended Unix file system info, I, I believe it's going to stay as experimental. There may be more work to do there to improve the performance. Um, the variable tap completion uh, is going to be stable. Interaction preference break is stable. Uh, selection emphasis is stable. Um, the next one I'm going to talk about, uh, invoke DC resource, is actually going to stay as experimental. There's more work to be done there. Um, but the idea here is um, we're trying to continue to at some level of support to DSC. So just um, to be clear, DSC is, is its own team. Uh, I don't own DSC at this point in time. So there is a whole other team that owns DSC. We have not had a lot of uh, time to address some. But one of the things that my team did, what, how is Pester not? There's some uh, quotes in there, Steve. Oh, excellent. Oh, I know, it's because these are like those funny quotes in VS Code. Um, anyways, uh, all right, so what are you complaining about now? Oh, I'm missing the equal sign too. How did uh, the dash? dash I'm missing all the dashes. <laughs> all right, in any case, yeah, what's happening here is that we made changes to invoke DC resource, so you can actually invoke it, and this will work on Windows and non-Windows, and it doesn't require uh, the local configuration manager to be on that system. We deliberately did this so that people can actually use DSC resources directly, uh, and they can also use it on um, Linux and Mac OS. So in this case, uh, what does it complain about? Throw unexpected state. Oh, come on. It's on what should be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what the should be doing? All right, what is it? Uh, right. There are no more experiences with the given module specification. There should be on the system. It shouldn't be case sensitive. Uh, do something real quick here. Oh, I don't have any resources. That's because I didn't install that one. Uh, which one? PS module. All right, if everything is, oh, what happened to my Windows box? Oh, all right, well, I'm gonna get on this demo, but the idea anyways, for those of you who are more familiar with DSC than I am, uh, is that you can use this method, uh, this command line call into a uh, DC resource that you can call test set get. All right, let's, Continue. Um, so uh, the next feature is coming from the community as well. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but there is this thing called Azure Data Studio. It looks a lot like Visual Studio, uh, not Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code. Uh, and basically it's intended for working with databases like uh, Microsoft SQL and stuff like that. Um, so there are a number of PowerShell users that really do a lot of stuff with uh, databases. I'll go back to uh, Windows PowerShell and show the difference here. Uh, DB null. So this will be false because these two things are not exactly the same. So the idea here is that if you were to query like a SQL table, 
then you can differentiate null, meaning that it doesn't exist, versus db null, meaning that it's explicitly set to a null value. Um, so the request from the community is actually for them to treat those two as the same thing. So that in your scripts, you don't have to um, worry about treating db null differently. So a small change, but this is something that helps the community. Um, and null string is, is similar. value as well. The idea here is you don't have to check for these things. Um, if you happen to have those in your scripts, you can just check it directly. Split with negative values is kind of cool. So I can do um, this another sentence. So if you're familiar with split, um, basically it's going to split the string uh, and I can split it you know, by the spaces and I get a bunch of um, elements or strings, and I could say like two. So this splits it into two strings where the first uh, occurrence of the white space and then the rest of it. But then if you want to split it from the other side, so rather than doing it from the left side of the string, now you can do like negative. So now it does exactly what you would expect, which is it splits into two strings, but it starts from the right hand side of the sentence versus the left. <clears throat> Pretty cool little change. For each parallel, this is a highly requested a highly requested feature. So this um, this really came from PowerShell workflow, which is not supported because uh, workflow is not supported in .NET Core anyway. So we can even enable it even if we wanted to. But um, our feedback from the community is a lot of people use PowerShell workflow really only for making it easy to run PowerShell scripts concurrently. So the change here is really a great example here. Uh, but it's going to show one to five. But if I add a sleep in here, actually, that's not going to help me either. Mm -hmm. These are actually all running in parallel, right? So if I didn't have parallel here, then it would all be running um, serially. So then each one is going to take its own half a second. You kind of saw previously it, it was a lot faster because each of them are starting in parallel. Uh, I think one of the key things here, and the engineer who wrote this on the team, Paul, had a blog post about this. Like, you should not just use this everywhere. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, there's actually a cost to starting up a thread and, and a run space. So if you just start putting everything as parallel, you may actually, you could potentially have worse performance. What you really need to do is look at where you have uh, maybe you're not you're under 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 utilizing the number of cores on your system, or if you're making like a network request where it's mostly waiting on something, it definitely makes a ton of sense to do it in parallel. Um, otherwise, you really should think about whether or not um, doing it serially makes sense. So it's not for every situation. Uh, Steve, question: um, Can you do that on multiple hosts, or is it localized to one host? I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Can you? Uh, run a parallel like uh, with the run spaces, you can run it on multiple hosts. When well, can you, hosts um, like it, multiple it, computers, you mean? Yes, yes. So normally you would do something like invoke command to do it remotely, like for each object doesn't have a dash computer or dash PS session parameter. But within um, the, the loop here, you can always do something like, you know, invoke command. Session, you know, uh, let's say that this is a list of sessions instead of numbers. Um, and then in here you could do your own script block here, right? Whatever this is. So you can certainly do it, um, but it's not part of the for each object uh, command that itself. Does that make sense? Yeah. You'd be creating a local run space for each invocation, and each of those run spaces can actually invoke something remotely, um, if that's what you're asking. The default throttle is five. Uh, so the throttle limit by default is five. You can set it yourself um, to have it. So, you know, we can't guess what your system is capable of or what your scenario is where it makes sense to have the number of threads spin up. So you can set it to whatever you want and you can set it, you know, like max value kind of thing if you really wanted to. Uh, and again, it may or may, next, may or may not make sense for your specific uh, scenario because it depends on what you're actually doing and a number of cores and number of CPUs on your system. Uh, but definitely play with that. Um, you know, you can always use measure command as a way to validate whether or not it's providing you the benefit that you think it's going to provide. Was it 
temp drive. Um, so this is a small one. Um, I'll just get the PS drive here. And one of the things we added is basically temp will map to your temp folder on your operating system. So if you're on Linux, it maps to that temp folder. If you're on Mac OS, it maps to that temp location. Um, so now you can just go directly into the temp drive. See, there's a bunch of temp files in here. Um, one thing that it doesn't do, if you're familiar with the test drive in Pester, it doesn't auto clean up. This is literally just mapping a shortcut to the temp drive. So you have to do your own cleanup if that's what you want. But it's a nice little thing. Um, how about abbreviation expansion? So uh, let me see, I think I have, Azure commands are very, are good examples of this use case. Um, so let's pick something like this one, wait, Azure RM recovery services backup job. So let's say that you're very familiar with that command, but you don't want to type the whole thing. So one of the things you can do is you just type all the uppercase characters. In this case, it'd be W, you have to put the dash, A-R-R-S-E-G. -A. And then if you tap complete, it's actually going to expand it to uh, the very verbose commandlet. So this is intended for uh, interactive use only. So if you actually, um, Type it like this, A R R S D J, and you hit enter. Like if you put that in your script, it's not going to find it because we're not going to expand it at runtime. It's only expanded for IntelliSense um, because we, we already don't want people to use aliases in scripts. It makes it less readable. So we certainly don't want like this to show up in a script. It, you don't know what that means for the most part, unless you're using something all the time that has, you know, uh, just very long commandlet name. Uh, so let's uh, jump into the Windows side of things. So uh, I don't know if these are going to be very interesting demos, but you know the clipboard commandments are back. Um, so I had that in my clipboard. I can also do you know I can put stuff into my clipboard. Set clipboard. And if I right click, then hello shows up. Um, and <laughs> so uh, people may not be aware, but in Partial Core Six, we actually didn't have the clipboard commandments because they depended on WinForms and WinForms was not um, in .NET 2.x, um, but they're added back in .NET 3. So we're able to do this. Uh, and these are cross-platform, yeah, as I mentioned. But um, they only work with text. So in Windows PowerShell, you could actually have um, like files in there um, that is not supported in PowerShell 7 clipboard. Uh, counter commandlets. So this is again back, this was not there before. Um, and the reason it wasn't there is it was using some private APIs. So we cleaned that up. So now we're, we're only using publicly documented APIs. So you, you can work with perf counters again uh, in partial seven. Uh, the recycle bin. Uh, this just clears recycle bin, yes. Um, so not that interesting, but it wasn't there before. Out printer as well, get hot fix. Um, is also back. Uh, I guess I don't have any hot fixes because I probably just got a new update of Windows 10 on this machine. Um, but the idea here is we wanted to add back as many of the commandlets that were owned by the PowerShell team that existed in Windows PowerShell that was not in PowerShell Core 6. So we got most of them. There's a few that are still not there, like local accounts is actually not shipped as far as PowerShell 7 because it's not using publicly documented APIs. However, um, if you import that module, stuff, PowerShell, local accounts. Um, oh, there's a different problem. It's because it's using an assembly. I don't think, is it gonna, yeah, it wasn't imported. I think if I start a new session, because this one, go preview, I'll make this bigger. Microsoft. Oh, no, there's a conflict. In any case, uh, unfortunately that's not gonna work, but um, local accounts is not there. There's um, one I never used before, which is control panel. is also not there because that's using some API that's not necessarily documented. Uh, and a few others. Uh, the WMI commands are there by design because we want people to use the sim commandlets. And the event log commands are not there because they got uh, superseded by the win event commandlets. Um, the old event log commands only work with the system application program logs. They don't work with all the ETW logs, but the get win event does. So, we're pretty close. There's a few that are still not there. See, uh, show the import when PS module. So, wait, Steve, you you skipped the most important one. Which one? Uh, grid view. 
Uh, oh, you're right. Sorry. Uh, okay. So, I don't know if everyone. So, okay. So first, I'll mention uh, it does pop up behind the new Windows terminal. That is a bug or an issue in the Windows terminal. Um, if you actually do like this, uh, it doesn't matter what it is. It will pop behind. So that's something they need to fix. All right. So don't. That's not something we can fix. But anyways, uh, if you don't use that grid view, let me just quickly explain what this is. Basically. This uh, is kind of like format table, but it allows you to select, you know, items. Actually, I didn't do the pass through, which makes this more interesting. So, uh, what a lot of people use this for um, is for two things. One is they can quickly, you know, be able to find something here. So, um, stuff that has W in it. These are processes, um, or you know, there's other criteria I can use filtering. So, it's gonna be redundant, but I'm gonna do process name. Uh, contains win. So all these have a W and contain win. Uh, but here, like I can select these, and then if I hit OK, then these get passed through to the rest of the pipeline. So I could actually have this in a script where I could tell someone, hey, I could do like a get service, I could pipe it to outgrid view, and then I could pipe that to stop service. Um, I probably wouldn't recommend that. But the idea is that you can actually interactively select um, objects to enact. The rest of your script with, and that's what people use that review actually a lot for. That's why there's this pass through. Um, and this is not available on partial core six because wind forms and WPF was not there, but now it is. And that might be, I have a separate. Uh, I'm going to do this first before I do the wind PS module one. So I have this WPF script here. Uh, and basically, it's very simple. It's just a little bit of XAML. It's going to bring up a photo that you've seen before, probably. Uh, oh, I popped up behind. Uh, yeah, the sad Joey. <laughs> it's paused, so it's going to close it. But you know, if you had scripts that leverage WP for WinForms, you can use it to uh, partial seven. Uh, so let me quickly, I don't want to take up all of you guys' time. So let me go to. Just show the three parts point real quick, then I'll get to the more interesting one. Just pass. So, Steve, the uh, WPF only works on Windows, not on Linux, right? That is very important. Uh, WPF, which is provided by .NET Core, is only on Windows. Um, if we have time, there's a different demo I can give on uh, Avalon or Avalonia, which is a cross platform solution for that. Uh, but, anyways, this is uh, about reparse points. So, if you're familiar with symlinks on Unix, on NTFS, um, reparse points can be symlinks, but they're not all symlinks. Basically, uh, these are all Apex stuff that I happen to have installed on my system here. And um, if you're in CMD, you would not see this because it doesn't support this kind of rendering. Uh, but let me get to the more interesting thing about Windows compatibility. Uh, I can use this Windows fine. Actually, no, I can't use this one. I need to use my VM that I already have. That up. The server machine, yes. Connect. All right, so there are still some modules in Windows that uh, basically will probably never work in PowerShell. Or I'm going to start with six here. So, Server Manager is one of those. That's why I have to have this uh, VM because it has to be on server. So, here it says, hey, this uh, module doesn't support core, so it's not going to work. You can try to use Skip Edition Check. And if you do this, then PowerShell core will try to load it. Uh, but it's not going to work because this other assembly isn't supported in .NET Core. So what we did in PowerShell 7, which is going to be this window here, is uh, I kind of explained earlier, we're going to then try, if we know that it's not supported core natively, we're going to load it in Windows PowerShell. So we actually started a Windows PowerShell process, actually. <coughs> So this is actually started. I didn't start Windows PowerShell. This is started on behalf as a child process of my PowerShell 7 um, process. Now server manager module is loaded. So I can give command module server manager. You know, you can see like these are all functions because these are all proxy functions. Uh, but we're not using WinArm remoting. We're using um, the job infrastructure to do remoting between these processes running in this um, my user session here. If I get Windows feature. I'll just type it because it's too long. Windows feature. Um, then it's going to work, but you kind of notice there's one difference here. This whole left side is blank. So there are small differences 
like if I run this in Windows PowerShell. Um, and what you should see is actually this kind of like tree view. Um, so this rendering is in a formatter that doesn't work over remoting, which is what's happening here. But basically, uh, functionally, it does work. So I mean, if you want to like add features, remove features, meaning Windows features, um, you can use these commandlets because from PowerShell 7, it's going to call into Windows PowerShell uh, and do that on your behalf. So this will work on a number of uh, modules that are shipping Windows that don't work directly with uh, Windows PowerShell. I mean, sorry, with PowerShell 7. Um, but it is kind of, um, there are some caveats. So for example, here, if I store the results, this is the first one, get member here. Um, it is deserialized because it, it is going through the remoting channel. So just like any other case where you're doing partial remoting, it is not a live object. That means you can't call methods on it. Um, you can call these local methods because these exist on any object. But if there's a method on this feature or like uninstall or something like that, you can't call it because it doesn't exist on the local copy. It only exists on the remote side. Uh, so you just have to be careful about that. But otherwise, if you're doing some basic commandlet invocations, then it should just work. is the extent. Uh, I feel like I kind of ran long on this. I want to give time for Q&A. I think I had anything else in here. So uh, I'm open for any questions you have about anything that I talked about or anything that I didn't talk about. Um, and I'll, I'll wait until like, uh, I guess Doug kicks me off. <laughs> I have a question. You, you, you might want to unshare your screen, uh, Steve, so we can oh, share. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so one of the questions I had was around kind of the cross-platform compatibility and how you um, basically configure that. Um, either it's kind of a central location or it's a um, function or you know, kind of file or what that question, can you repeat it? Yeah, so for instance, out printer is only available on Windows. How do you kind of configure that or specify, or where is that specified? And then, you know, which OS it can basically run on? I'm sorry, I, I'm missing like the middle part. <laughs> I'm, okay, I'm not sure. um, so out printer, for instance. Out printer, yes. Yeah, it's only available on Windows. Um, really, yes. When where do you kind of specify which operating systems you can run on? Oh, uh, so if you, okay, so um, if I understand the question, so like, for example, OutPrinter is only available on Windows currently, and you're writing some scripts, um, and you want to make it work cross-platform, right? So uh, currently, you probably, to be safe, would have to do like a git command on OutPrinter to see if it's available. Um, there is work that we plan on doing in the post-7 timeframe to make some of those commandlets cross-platform. Uh, OutPrinter may be one of those, uh, but for example, um, there has already been a couple of pull requests to make stop computer and restart computer work cross-platform. So that won't make it in time for PowerShell 7, but those will show up in PowerShell 7.1. Uh, for OutPrinter, that, that's actually probably pretty easy to make cross-platform because there's uh, Linux native commands we can just call into to do that capability. Uh, but other ones like clear recycle bin, for example, which I wouldn't necessarily expect to see in your automation, um, requires calling some native API. So that's a lot more work. So that probably isn't going to happen. But in general, if your concern is about what commands are available on Windows versus non Windows, then you probably need to do checks to see if you know a priori that that's not available, then you can do like is Linux, is Mac OS. Um, you know, those are default uh, variables that are defined. Otherwise, you can always do a git command. Like in our build scripts on PowerShell, we always do a git command. If uh, certain commands are not available, then we'll error out that you have to install something. If I, maybe can rephrase, maybe, maybe this is what you were asking. If you're authoring a module and you want to make sure that certain functions are only available on certain OSs, okay. what should you do? If you're authoring a module that requires using something in PowerShell, PowerShell commandlet, like, like I think the answer is the same whether it's a PowerShell commandlet or if you're relying on a so you're building a module on Linux, uh, but the different Linux distros have different commands available, right? They're not all the same. So you're going to have to probably do a runtime check to say, hey, here's my dependencies. And if anything's not there, then you're going to have to provide a meaningful error to the user. That's, that's but I guess the opposite, though, right? The opposite is if I want to make sure that my function only works on one OS, 
I think you have to specify that in the manifest and that is probably a per module so tag. Module right? manifest doesn't have a OS uh, check. So you would have to do, well, if you only care about Windows, I mean, you could always uh, require 5.1. I mean, that's a cheat around that. Um, but I think what we've been doing is in your, uh, even if you have a binary module, you can still have a PSM one um, and that can do a runtime check uh, and error out. Um, in the gallery though, we do have specific tags to indicate what operating systems will support it. So uh, we don't have to support impartial Git yet. Um, I, I wanna have it added in impartial Git v3, which I didn't really talk about here. Um, so that if you're trying to install a module that is not applicable to your operating system, it should give you a good error message. Um, today, it will still install it and it just won't work. But we do have those tags in the gallery to indicate that this is on Linux, this is on uh, Mac OS and Windows. Uh, we don't have the granularity that this is for Red Hat versus Ubuntu, stuff like that. So, so Steve, you just, you just mentioned PowerShell get v3, which was yeah. going to be my question. Sure. So what can you say that you guys think you are addressing in V3 as opposed to 2.x and prior? Sure. So uh, PowerShell Gallery and PowerShell Get are two projects I took over fairly recently, like about six months ago. So one of the first things I wanted to do once I took ownership of PowerShell Get is to fix, in my opinion, a lot of the wrongs that were maintained for back backwards compatibility sake. Um, so for me, uh, one of the big user experiences I want to fix is you don't have to do all these switches. You know, you'll, you'll do like, I want to install like the latest piece of Reliant or something like that. And that's maybe not a great example. Uh, but you want to install the latest module and it says, hey, uh, these functions are already exported. And you have to do like allow clobber. Or, you know, this version is already installed, but maybe it's a different publisher because we have one that's inbox versus like pester. You have to pester one on inbox versus the one you want to install from the gallery. So if you like skip publisher check, um, you have to do like dash force and all this stuff. So we don't want to kind of like make it much easier for users. Like, hey, we know that you want to install this thing. Let's just make it install, you know, so you can use it. Uh, so that big user experiences. There's other user experiences like we want to adopt a NuGet versioning syntax. So if you want, so for example, let's say that you have a, a module uh, in your development environment and you require Pester uh, 3, right? Uh, but you want to use the latest version of 3. You should not be using version 3, by the way, but let's say you want to use the latest version of 3 and you don't want to use the move to 4 because it's a breaking change. And today, you kind of have to say max version 3.999999, like, you know, you, you can't go to four. So using the NuGet syntax, you could actually say, hey, you minimax three to four, where three is inclusive and four is exclusive. So we can do the right thing there. Um, so that, that way we can manage dependencies much easier. So from a user experience, those are some of the things that we want to do. In addition to stuff like, you know, you should be able to just install an arbitrary uh, NuGet package from NuGet.org and use those. So you can call those APIs. We want to uh, light all those scenarios up. Um, from an engineering standpoint, one of the big things I really want to do is actually remove a dependency on package management um, and also move the script module to a C-sharp based module, which actually makes it easier for us to maintain because it's a very complex module. Um, so that's the big effort is really removing pa package management, um, also known as one get. Um, that's also something I owned and I think the reality is one Git did not fulfill its initial vision and it doesn't make sense to continue to invest resources in that at this point in time. Um, so I'm moving away from that right now. Um, and also basically improving the user experience for partial Git so that it's more similar to like apt, things like that. So another thing that we're doing is having a local cache. So now you can do, uh, you know, one of the things that I want to hook into is if we have a local cache, finds will be much faster, but also if you try to use a command that is not installed in your system, we can detect that until you install this module to get this command. So there's some, some cool things we can do to light that up. Uh, unfortunately, PowerShell Get V3 is a very complex project to kind of basically rewrite PowerShell Get from scratch. So uh, I wanted to have like a preview to try out this calendar year. It's not going to happen. Um, we'll have a preview probably first quarter of next year to try that out. And it'll be side by side with V2 because it won't be complete. Uh <coughs> Steve, a uh, question on partial and performance. Yeah. So do you want to discuss 5.1 versus 7GA, whatever is planned, uh, performance, just uh, engine performance and the load time, and you know, the, the first run kind of thing. Yep. Um, so I don't have any uh, numbers to share with you right now. Uh, I had other blog posts before on just uh, performance improvements. So .NET Core itself has invested in a lot of performance improvements over .NET Framework. 
Uh, we've also made some targeted and also community has made some targeted performance improvements in PowerShell. So from a runtime perspective, in general, your scripts will just run faster in PowerShell 7 versus uh, Windows PowerShell 5.1. Um, it'll also take less memory and stuff like that. So there's a lot of goodness there. I don't have any numbers to tell you like it's going to be 100%, whatever. Um, I think that's something we'll probably have as a follow-up uh, blog post when we get closer to GA. Now, as far as startup, though, um, that is something that is very difficult to solve. So I can tell you right now, PowerShell 7 will start slower than Windows PowerShell 5.1. The technical reason, which is uh, in .NET Framework and Windows, uh, when we ship Windows PowerShell, we <laughs> ship it as MSIL. This is the intermediate language. It's not compiled for your, your architecture. When you first time you run it in Windows, uh, a thing called Engine is executed, and it's going to compile Windows PowerShell intermediate .NET language into the native code for your processor. Um, so that's a one-time hit, so that's a cold start. But after that, um, you're basically getting an optimized uh, managed assembly as native code all the time. Um, it's different for .NET Core uh, for various reasons. One of the reasons they don't have a GAC anymore, a global assembly cache. So what we do is we do do a thing called cross-gen. So cross-gen will compile parts of our code from managed code to native code, but it's not complete. It's, uh, when you do engine, pretty much everything's native code. So we have this uh, ceiling limiting factor with .NET Core where we can only be so fast. Uh, we know that there's some other things that we could do on our side to make it faster. Um, again, I don't have numbers in front of me, but I think that uh, those PowerShell was probably around, uh, if you don't have a profile, it was probably around maybe like 300 to 400 milliseconds startup. Uh, and then PowerShell 7 is probably closer to like 600 to 800 milliseconds, depending on your system. So. That's something we want to look at in uh, PowerShell 7.1 timeframe to see if there's other things that we're doing during startup that we can not do. Um, we, can, we can improve that, but it's going to be hard to get parity with Windows PowerShell without having more just native code in there. Um, also, is it different across OS distros? I mean, Windows and Ubuntu or RHEL? It is different because the, the um, cross shin compilation code is different for .NET Core. Um, I know that in the past, they had some bugs where it was slower on Mac. But um, again, that's all kind of outside of our scope. We're just leveraging their tools. Uh, in general, I mean, if you were to compare, for example, on Linux, uh, PowerShell startup versus Bash, uh, we're going to lose every time because we just do a lot more stuff uh, on startup than Bash does. But uh, that is one of the things that we do know is a potential pain point for customers. And we're trying to figure out uh, interesting ways to reduce that startup time. It's not going to happen in partial 7 GA. Other questions? <clears throat> Go ahead. Is PS Readline available in VS Code yet? Integrated console yet? Uh, good question. So PS Readline is a project that my team took over from Jason Shirk, who is still involved, but he just uh, doesn't have the time to be the primary maintainer anymore. Um, so the way it works is that whenever we ship a new uh, editor extensions, partial ex editor, uh, PS editor extensions, we do ship a new version of PS3 line if it's available. So I expect that we should have a new drop of the extension either tomorrow or next week. Um, <coughs> we have the beta, what is it? Beta, I think it's beta six, I can't remember now. The, the latest beta that we have are, uh, no, well, we should have the release candidate for PS3 line 2.0 in that release. So we're, we're getting close to a GA of the PS3 line 2.0. Um, and, and I'll also mention with GA, and the, the target is to uh, have a general available general availability of PS2.0 in January, right before PR Show 7. That way, PR Show 7 can pick it up. And our plan is to check that back into Windows so that Windows PR Show 5.1 will have PS2.0 uh, GA. That should address hopefully any remaining issues on the Windows PR Show side. So, short answer yeah, it, it ships every time to. Uh, we we pick up a new version of PS3 line when, when it's available with the uh, extension. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, what's happening with remoting uh, cross-platform, right? So on the Windows side, we're used to WinRM. Um, remoting from, uh, let's say, PowerShell 7 on Linux to Windows or vice versa. Should we all switch to SSH now? Is that? Uh, the answer is yes, but let me go provide a little more detail there. So in PowerShell Core 6.0, one of the things we did, and I didn't mention earlier, was we did do the uh, PowerShell remoting over SSH. So if you were to just use SSH uh, and you want to remote to another machine and start PowerShell, you can still do that. That, that doesn't involve PowerShell directly. What we did is we plumbed PowerShell remoting protocol over SSH so that if you make that connection, 
you can actually get objects and that just text back to your client machine. Um, so the, the big difference between WinRAM remoting and SSH remoting at this point in time is that uh, SSH remoting is cross-platform. Um, WinRAM-based remoting is partially cross-platform supported. What that means is that if you're on Linux or Mac OS and you're trying to use WSMAN-based remoting, uh, there are things that work and things that don't work. Um, for example, Kerberos support is not really there. Intel and support is not really there. There's, there's potentially ways to do, make it work on Linux, but the idea is, or the, the reason is that those are not native concepts on Linux. Those, those are native things on Windows, so we don't have to write that code. Um, there was this other project, I don't want to go into a ton of detail, called OMI, uh, Open Management Instrumentation and Infrastructure, not really sure, don't remember now, but it's basically like an open source version of WMI. Uh, and the WSAN remoting leveraged that, and that OMI project is no longer funded. So they're no longer, there's no, no longer Microsoft engineers working on that project. So all the limitations that we have, where I know customers are complaining, like, hey, I'm on a MacBook, I want to remote to Exchange Online via WSAN because they don't support SSH today. Uh, sorry, uh, you know, when it worked, it worked, but there's no one, uh, you know, supporting the OMI project, so we're not going to get those bugs fixed. Um, so our future uh, from the PowerShell team is to say, hey, you should really be using SSH remoting. It's actually a lot better than WSMAN. There's a lot more uh, authentication um, you know, methods you can use. You can do two-factor. You can do all this cool stuff. Um, there's some, uh, I'll mention that even in PowerShell 7.1 timeframe, one of the things I want to leverage is SSH remoting so that from a local VS code, you could actually do PowerShell uh, debugging to, let's say, Azure DevOps container, right, which you can't do today. And the hard part about that is that the Azure DevOps container doesn't have incoming ports open by design. Uh, you can only do outgoing ports. And then on your local you know, laptop, you probably don't want to have incoming SSH ports either. But um, using both outgoing SSH connections, there's a te technique in SSH using reverse tunneling, going through like a middle fashion server that you can actually connect through. So those are some scenarios we want to light up and it just leverages SSH. Um, the reality is SSH is the protocol in the industry. Uh, and we're going to continue to make investments in there thing that is not supported yet in SSH that is supported in WinRM is GIA. So I don't know if you guys have used GIA or know about it, but it's just enough administration. The idea is you can have a constrained uh, endpoint, a remoting endpoint. So somebody on your enterprise or you know business, uh, let's say they're the printer admin, then you can give them access to a set of constrained commandlets, even parameters or parameter values, so they can only do stuff against that printer service. Um, so that is something we highlight in PowerShell for uh, Windows PowerShell. You can also do it with PowerShell 7 on Windows uh, using WSMAN, but you can't do it with the SSH. That's something we want to look into in the future, but it's a very hard problem. It's, uh, there's a lot of work involved to make that happen. And, and SSH on Windows, uh, open SSH, is, uh, is that production ready yet? It has been production ready for at least since 1903, I think. But it is a feature on demand on Windows 10 and Server 2019. Um, my team, and to be honest, it's really like one and a quarter engineers. Uh, we do regular uh, merges of upstream changes of open SSH into the Windows fork. And then we check those back into Windows. Um, but it is not something that happens very quickly. And it's not something that you guys can get very quickly. Um, I think that the alternative is if you've heard about this new thing called Azure Arc uh, that was announced at Ignite, basically allows you to attach your on-prem you know, computers to Azure and manage it that way. There, we already have this thing in Azure called the um, Azure OpenSSH extension, which makes it easy to install OpenSSH on Windows. Uh, so that might be another way for you to install OpenSSH, even on non-Win 10. Like those will work on Windows Server 20, 2012 R2, I think, and above, something like that. I don't remember exactly that versions, but we, we are still supporting OpenSSH, but you know, it's hard to support at down level. Um, it's just a lot of work, to be honest, with very little resources. Um, any other questions? Do you know, yeah, do you know any plans for um, the Intune module? Is there any objectives for that? Or uh, I don't have any knowledge about that, specifically about Windows Intune. Um, what I would recommend <laughs> is if, you, if you're on Twitter and you'd send me a message, I can find out the appropriate people to talk to if you have a specific question about that. But if you already know about the Intune folks on Twitter, you can just talk to them directly about Pasha. Like my, my general thing is if you, if you as a customer talk to those teams directly, 
it is much more impactful than having someone from the PowerShell team talk to them because from their point of view, it's like, oh, it's just another PowerShell team ask versus this is a real customer with a real, real pain point. Got it. Okay. Yeah, direct module. Uh, so I'm going to cover that in two different ways. Uh, so in Win 10, uh, and this would have been in the last October update of Windows 10, and with the PowerShell Core 6.1, if you're using Win 10, I forget what they called it, but it was the October refresh, whatever, uh, with PowerShell Core 6.1, the Active Directory module just works. Like we, we made changes in that module um, in the Windows code base. Now, there are there was a bug in there in .NET Core, so if you use it with PowerShell 7, it actually works better. Uh, but that should just work. Now, if you're talking about like uh, Windows 7 or Windows 8 or the equivalent server, then the changes that we made in the inbox version of that module won't go down level. I mean, those won't meet the servicing bar. But if you use the new WinPS, uh, I don't know, I'm sure what we call it, the WinPS wrapper, or you know, when we do the import module, then that should work for you. So that's another way on down level operations to use Active Directory module with PowerShell 7. But I, I guess the difference will be, you know, in the, if you're on the latest Windows 10 versions, you get the, the true objects. But if you go on earlier versions, you get, you get the, the, the serialized ones, right? That's correct. Thank you. I have a question about kind of the whole process, right, of getting, getting PowerShell 7 out. What was the most heated debate or contentious change or <laughs> difficult conversation in your memory if you're asking about from a technology standpoint um it was probably some of the uh, the language changes so just so you know like uh we have this thing called the partial committee it's uh primarily myself joey dombo who's uh one of the engineers on the team um, and Jim, who is one of the original PMs and now an engineer on the partial team. But we also have uh, Bruce Payette and Kenneth Hansen, who's at AWS on the committee as well. Um, and we don't always agree. Uh, and I won't name any names here, but you know, when we introduced the, the language features, some community members asked, it's like, you know, why have this? You know, like people can do if statements, you know, it's like uh, you're, you're adding complexity. And you know, the argument is, yeah, we are adding options, but it's really the user decides what they want to do. And, and the feedback from the community is they want these language features. So uh, in this case, it was a majority kind of rules kind of situation um, for that. Uh, there's been some other, I don't know, this is recorded, so I don't want to call out any specific community <laughs> race stuff because the people I mentioned, I don't want to mention the people. If I mention the issue, they'll know who they are. But there have been we some can, suggestions. We can edit it out. We'll edit it out. Say, let me just say this. Um, there's been some, you know, RFCs and issues raised by the community on things they want to see changed. And they're always good suggestions in a vacuum. But when we look at it from, hey, is it consistent with the partial philosophy? Um, does it make sense? Then we can't, we don't always say yes. And that, that's always been a painful conversation um, because partly right now the, commu the committee is a closed group of folks. I'll just say that one of the things we've been discussing in the committee is actually make it more open. When I say openness, we actually want to invite more community members into the committee and probably have a separation of a technical committee versus like a board um, that kind of one is more tactical and some more, one is more strategic. Um, but we haven't kind of closed on that structure. Um, but I know that there's a number of posture MVPs that would be interested in joining that. But uh, there's some challenges there to figure out like, uh, how do we get people into the committee? How do we get them out of the committee and stuff like that? So. It's a direction we're trying to head, but we're, we haven't closed on that specific thing yet. Oh, and I'll, I'll just say the other thing about uh, process. Uh, one of the most difficult things is really, you know, and we feel kind of bad about this because we know like when we open up the partial RC repo, we wanted the community to, to submit a bunch of stuff um, <laughs> that we could review. And we recognize that we're kind of way behind on reviewing those RCs because we are uh, a small set of people, and we only have two meetings a week because we have other things that are part of our job that we have to do. Um, so we feel kind of bad that we've always prioritized like our own RFCs ahead of the community. So that's something we're also trying to figure out how to change and make it more optimal. Part of it is getting more people in the committee so that we have you know more people involved. But part of it is also maybe making it a little bit lighter weight. You know, we recommend people open issues to discuss it before you spend the whole time authoring RFC and stuff like that. So we're all, we're also trying to figure out you know. How to make things easier for both us and also for the community so that we can actually together have a much better product. Questions? 
Steve, you mentioned uh, bringing out some of your team members to talk about the work done on the you know, CICD pipeline stuff yep. to summit. I don't think I saw that on the agenda. Is that going to be like a side session? Yeah. Uh, currently, so uh, I'll give you some insights on like uh, partial summit, partial conference uh, Europe and partial conference Asia. Uh, usually what happens is that we will get uh, a number of sessions reserved for the partial team and we will not decide on what those topics are until um, much later. So, so we have a different, well, like we, I mean, I, it's kind of maybe unfair maybe, but we, we have a different process versus the open call process. Um, so we have not closed on what our topics are. Part of the reason is like, you know, as we're moving past partial seven, like there may be something more interesting to talk about than what we plan to talk about right now. Uh, but we'll have a number of sessions at each of these conferences. Um, I think for partial summit, I do want some of the folks like on my team, it would have been like Jim was involved, Aditya was involved, and Travis was involved uh, in really bringing up a very comprehensive CICD. And it's not just CIC, but also just a release system um, that really uh, reduced the amount of man hours that we put into getting a release out. And a lot of it really leverages not only the Azure DevOps, but also PowerShell scripts. So, I really want them to talk about that. So hopefully you guys can learn from that and use it for yourself. So I'm not committing them right now to that topic, but I, even if they don't do that, we will probably at least maybe have some blog posts or I know that Jason Helmick is having his own video series. We could do it there as well. So there's a lot of different avenues where we can talk about that. Um, I mean, just on that point, I use a lot of the stuff I saw on the GitHub for the PowerShell pieces. I use a lot of that stuff for my modules that I do in Azure DevOps. So uh, super, super helpful. Getting more detail would be great. But I also have a question on PowerShell Azure Functions. Oh, go ahead. Um, yeah, can you just talk to PowerShell Azure Functions? I know that they're moving to a new another release. I know there's durable functions that might be coming. I don't think it's part of your team anymore, but just some general stuff would be great to hear. Sure. Um, so I'll, uh, yeah, one of the things we mentioned is about the, the team aspect. So when um, Azure Functions 2.0 wanted to have PowerShell support because they did their own uh, PowerShell, Windows PowerShell support for the 1.x release. Uh, we were not involved with that. Um, they they want to talk to us. Like, how do we get partial core six in there? Uh, two of the people on my team, Tyler, who does a lot of the streaming stuff, and also Dombo, um, they were involved in actually authoring the uh, PowerShell language worker for Azure Functions 2.0. So one of the things we're really focused on is actually having a great PowerShell experience. So we didn't want to just say, hey, you're already familiar with writing an Azure Functions C Sharp app. Uh, here's how you do it in PowerShell. We were really like, hey, you're a PowerShell scripter. Here's how it, would, it should look like in uh, Azure Functions. Um, so we shipped that, and once we uh, had the public preview, we handed that ownership over to the Azure Functions team. So they own it now. Um, we also had a prototype for Durable Functions. Um, we had some reservations about that because, to be honest, Durable Functions as a concept is very complicated, and I don't know if users are ready for that. Um, but I, I believe that is a highly asked thing, and I, I'm comfortable seeing that the Azure Functions team will be able to deliver that. Um, what I can also say is that we uh, continue to have conversations with them and I expect that they will move to PowerShell 7 fairly quickly. Um, I don't know if they will be able to get there um, by RC timeframe, but at least by GA, uh, I would hope that they will be able to offer PowerShell 7 in Azure Functions around the time we um, have GA in January. All right. Yes, that's everything. Thank you very much, Steve. Thanks, Steve. No problem. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You guys have a good night. Uh, I'm going to hang up now. All right. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.